Hello, we welcome you all. Um, this is a, a joint webinar of the uh, Royal Statistical Society Emerging Applications section and the Royal Statistical Society Journal webinars. We thank to everybody who contributed to it. Um, at the webinar um, joint contribution of um, Philip Bach, Viktor Czernozhukov, and Martin Spindler will be presented on heterogeneity in the US gender wage gap, which was recently published in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society Series A. Um, as a measure of gender inequality, the gender wage gap has come to play an important role both in academic research and the public debate. In 2017-18, uh, the UK mandated for the first time all sizable employers to collect and then publish data showing their gender pay gaps. This initiative has provided a vivid demonstration of statistics power and potential, as well as their ability to stimulate both informed debate and meaningful change. In 2019, Royal Statistical Society has, among other, adopted 10 recommendations for better gender pay gap reporting in the document, better data for fair employment statistics role in tackling the gender pay gap. Also, um, recently, Sverige Sigsbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel has been awarded to Professor Claudia Goldin for uncovering key drivers of gender differences in the labor market. All of this led us to the invitation for this excellent article, which will be co-presented by Martin Martin Spindler and Philipp Bach, both of uh, University of Hamburg, uh, of Hamburg, uh, Germany. Um, um, just shortly to recap their article, but they will present it in more length. In the 2016, the majority of full-time employed women in the United States earned significantly less than comparable men. The extent to which women were affected by gender inequality in earnings, however, depended greatly on socioeconomic characteristics, such as marital status or educational attainment. In their paper, author analyzed data from the 2016 American Community Survey using a high dimensional wage regression and probably applying double suit to quantify heterogeneity in the gender wage gap. They will present their findings. They found that the wage gap varied substantially across women and magnitude of the gap, um, the gap varied primarily by marital status, having children at home, race, occupation, industry, and education. These insights are naturally very helpful in designing policies that can reduce discrimination and unequal pay more effectively, which connects this to what I mentioned about the RSS documents and objectives. So hopefully the presentation presentation will raise a nice debate. The webinar will be recorded. My name is Andrei Sraker. I'm um, part of the coordination of the Emerging Application section um, of the Royal Statistical Society. So without further ado, I give the word to Martin and Philip. I will ask you to share naturally your screen with the slides and the questions will be taken in the chat uh, and asked um, at the end of the presentation, maybe one of two uh, already in between. Please, Philip Martin, start. Thank you very much, uh, Andre, for this uh, kind introduction. And thanks a lot also for the invitation. It's a great honor here to present at the Royal Statistical uh, Society. I will start with the first part, and then Philip uh, will take over. For this, I share my slides. Hope everyone can see. Um, so the topic is heterogeneity in the US uh, gender wage gap. Uh, the plan is the following. I will start with an introduction and motivation. Then there will be a short digression on so-called double machine learning, which is the underlying um, technology or methodology, which allows us to do valid inference in the high dimensional complex setting. And then I will pass to Philip, who will present the empirical analysis uh, and present the results and discuss the results. And then finally, you also have time for discussions and uh, any uh, open questions. So may let's briefly, get started. Sorry, may, may I briefly interrupt? I can't see the screen. I don't know yes. if it's only me. Maybe we can maybe you can no, share it. I, I, can't, I can't as well. Sorry, I can't. Yeah, okay. So. Uh, then. Uh, oh, so your face is hidden. Okay. Does it work now? Yes. Now Thanks. Okay. Thanks. 
So here again, the outline introduction, then we do the digression on double learning, where I will introduce the methodology, and then I pass to Philip for the uh, empirical study. So let's get started with the introduction. Uh, as we said before, if someone wants to read it up in more detail, uh, the talk is based on this uh, publication, which was published in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society Series A uh, beginning this year, so January, so it's <laughs> brand new in press. And the wage gap, but also gender pay gap, usually denotes the average difference between the wages for men and women who are working. Uh, and the gender wage gap has come to play an important role both in academic research, where there's been a lot of interest to quantifying, estimating as a gender wage gap, but of course in the public debate uh, and related how the gender wage gap might be uh, reduced. There's a lot of literature on this, but most empirical studies employ decomposition methods and report residual estimates of the gender wage gap in averages. So the, uh, there are often unconditional comparisons between uh, the wages of men and women, but this is of course misleading because men and women might have different experiences, different backgrounds, which are paid differently in industry. Therefore, it's important, first of all, to consider or conditioning on relevant factors or um, take into uh, consideration different variables, but this often in most studies uh, relies on the ever comparison of averages. But recognizing heterogeneity with respect to observable characteristic is key to tailor effective policies and establish pay equality. And this was also our motivation to this um, project was really finding out is the heterogeneity in the gender wage gap identifying subgroups which are more affected so that we can tailor specific policies to help uh, these uh, targeted subgroups. Uh, and of course, maybe some of you have followed this, in particular socialism background in economics. In 2023, the Economic Nobel Prize was awarded, as uh, Andre already mentioned, to Claudia Goldin, who has worked a lot of um, in empirically on understanding uh, uh, gender wage gaps and related uh, topics. A brief literature review. As we said, this is an active field of research. Blau and Kahn uh, have a recent survey where they summarize results uh, in gender wage gap. As I said, the standard approach currently are decomposition methods. For example, the famous Oxaka blinded decomposition, which is a standard method where the uh, gender wage gap is split up in what can be explained by characteristic, what can be not explained, but it's focused on averages. Surprisingly, uh, but this also refers to other fields of economics, little research on heterogeneity uh, has been done. And heterogeneity is now an important topic because often there's not one measure or, or all are affected the same way, but we observe that in the data there's heterogeneity and finding this out is a crucial point in, in almost all applications, but of course in particular also on the gender wage gap. In one important study, Gold in 2014, she analyzes heterogeneous effects, but only in one dimension, she analyzes occupational effects. Blau and Kahn 2017, they analyze heterogeneity on the gender wage gap across income distribution. So they have a look in another dimension, so to speak. But you see in this example that in most empirical studies, heterogeneity is only considered in one or two dimensions. So it's heterogeneity according to occupational effects or along the distribution. But there has been, at least from our point of view, lacking a systematic analysis where you really, in a data-rich environment, in a data-driven way, try to find out which subgroups are affected. And this is the approach we or direction we go, that we use machine learning methods, in particular, the so-called double machine learning approach to do an extensive analysis of heterogeneity in a data-driven way and also to provide a valid inference. Uh, so this is uh, from the content point of view what we are after, but there are also some methodological challenges we need to solve along the way. One is we have a large number of explanatory variables, because if you think about um, the gender wage gap what, uh, might vary according to occupation, but usually in survey data or, 
occupation is coded in 80 or more categories. And, and you have many, many uh, variables with many uh, categories. So it's a huge number of explanatory variables which might lead to heterogeneity. So this is one challenge. Then we want, need to do inference on many interaction effects because the pattern can be quite complex. There might be non-linearities, in the simplest case, interaction of categorical variables. And therefore, we have a huge set of potential drivers where we need to do uh, inference. Then we need want to do, of course, valid inference. Uh, if you use machine learning methods for variable selection, this is widely done, but we also uh, want to uh, do inference and check uh, are these effects in the subroot significant. And this related to this, if a multiple testing problem and simultaneous inference problems, because so we will see thousands of subgroups where we won't need to do uh, joint uh, testing. The second methodological challenge is quantification of the gender wedge gap and visualization. So we'll see later that the heterogeneous effect beta xi is for certain individual with certain characteristics. What is the associated gender wedge gap uh, beta xi? This is will be an heterogeneous wedge coefficient. And we would like to also visualize this information because we have many, many subgroups, but how can we in a handy way uh, visualize as a heterogeneity. And for this, we introduce so-called quantile plots and also provide uniform valid uh, confidence bands. Philip later, when he displays the application, he will uh, show us uh, quantile plots um, and uh, val uh, uniform valid confidence bands where we get good insights how large is the extent of heterogeneity. And these tools are not only important here for gender wage gap, but can also be used for other related uh, problems. So the contribution of our paper is we analyze heterogeneity in the US gender wage gap and in terms of we provide partial effects of potential determinants and valid inference in a data rich environment. So we can figure out what are the drivers so in which dimension, in which direction is heterogeneity and uh, can do valid inference for this. And then we provide quantile plots of the US gender wage gap uh, using uh, US uh, survey data. So uh, we will dive into data later, but we use the American Community Service, which is a very rich, a very representative uh, data set. Maybe now let's have a look at the modeling. So in labor economics, the fundamental workhorse are so called Mintz equation, and we do not. Um, um, employ the original Mintz equation, we do some kind of variant. But in labor economics, usually our outcome variable is the log of the hourly wage. And Mintz, in his original work, he regressed the uh, wage on sc schooling, experience, and experience squared. Here we do, is, uh, we call it Mintz, uh, Mintzerian type equation. So um, of course, we include schooling, we include, uh, include experience as control variables, so they, they are all captured in the XI. What you're interested in is the effect of female or gender on wage. So beta is, is, will be uh, the gender wage gap. So this means two individuals which have the same characteristics, it, uh, is there a difference in payment if they are men or women? And, and this effect is exactly a beta. And here in this basic type of formulation, the gender wage gap beta is constant, but we want to allow for heterogeneity. Therefore, we here uh, modify the specification and make the coefficient beta depending on the observables. So this means depending on experience, uh, depending on schooling, depending maybe on marital status and many variables, as a, a beta which determines the uh, gender wage gap can uh, vary. So what we want to do is variation of the uh, wage gap according to various socioeconomic characteristics like marriage status, having children at home, occupation, industry, hours worked, and many, many uh, more. Okay, now how do we formulate this heterogeneity, so this beta of xi? The simplest thing is we do a linear expansion. And the, what we're doing is we take all of these potential drivers of heterogeneity and interact this, uh, with female. And now our task is, so here we have many, many coefficients, and now we have to do inference. We have to estimate this many coefficients, and, and then we have to do valid inference if these coefficients are really 
significant so that in the subgroup uh, there is a difference in payment according to gender. So this will be the strategy. So what we will have is a highly interacted uh, model and th this part here will be interpreted then as a heterogeneity part. For, as interpretation of a selected parameter beta j, this is the increase of the absolute value of the wage gap according to a one unit change in x uh, j. Okay, here are some technical notes. So in, from a conceptual point of view, it's quite uh, straightforward. What we also would do in a low dimensional setting, if you think this heterogeneity, we can model this by including interaction terms. But here we have a complicated high dimensional problem because if we interact all our variables like occupation, maybe field of degree and so on, we get 4,000 uh, variables uh, in which the directions we could have heterogeneity. And now what we need to do is we need to do valid inference on many, many coefficients at the same time. And the first challenge will be how can we do valid inference uh, on one uh, coefficient? For this, we use the double selection framework of Belloni et al. 2014. In the paper, we extend this because we not want to do only inference on a single uh, coefficient beta in this expansion, but we also would like to do inference on the whole effect. So beta had xi somehow the function of the coefficients, um, and one can show that this uh, is then uh, normally distributed or for some normal process or Gaussian process. And we use then the multiplier bootstrap of Genesukov et al. Uh, for construction of joint confidence band for this uh, overall effects because the beta head xi is for certain individual with certain xi values what is the gender wage back uh, and we have many many individuals so we have many many different values of beta head xi and now the question is how can we do valid inference and visualize this and this uh, we'll see in the second part because then we we'll provide quanta plots on this beta head xi's so the beta head xi's um, the all effects for all individuals, and we want to do simultaneous inference on this. Simultaneous inference in high dimensional settings becomes more and more important as we have more complex, more rich data sets. Um, we have more variables in where we would like to do inference, so it's getting more and more um, uh, attention. If you're interested in how to do simultaneous inference, in high dimensional settings, um, we would like to refer you to uh, Bach et al. 2018, where we provided a, a, some small survey on how to do um, simultaneous inference. Okay, this was a little bit the motivation, setting out the problem and also uh, uh, thinking about the methodological challenges. Now, before we come to the results, a short digression on double machine learning. Maybe not everyone of you is familiar with this, but this is the key which allows to do as valid inference in high dimensional settings. And with digitalization, big data sets or high dimensional data sets become more and more available. Machine learning methods mostly focus on prediction. So machine learning learns correlations and uses this for prediction. But in many situations, we are interested in learning, maybe not necessarily causal, but we learn want to learn correlations and making inference. We would like to uh, figure out maybe it's a, if this is a causal parameter or if it's not a causal parameter, we would like to do valid inference on the predictive effect. And therefore, we need to combine statistical modeling, which has the strengths in inference, with machine learning. And this is also the idea of causal machine learning, combining classical causal inference or inference methods and modern uh, machine learning methods. And here we apply this machinery to estimate heterogeneity in the gender wage gap with machine learning methods. So, the framework is always the same. We have a low dimensional parameter theta naught. In the Minzer equation, this could be beta so if, if men and women are paid differently, or if we have more parameters when we do the interaction, it can be a low dimensional parameter. So theta naught is our target parameter. It might be one selected coefficient, or it might be also uh, several uh, coefficients we want to do inference on. And uh, the problem is that we have a high dimensional nuisance parameter theta not we're in a high dimensional setting we have a target parameter but we have a high dimensional nuisance parameter and now the idea is 
that we estimate this nuisance parameter, which is high dimensional, with modern machine learning methods. So we can use whatever is our preferred method, random forest, boosted trees, lasso, deep learning, standard neural nets. And now the question is, if we estimate the nuisance part by this modern machine learning methods, has this an effect on the inference on our target parameter? Um, and, and our target is we would like to have valid inference on the target parameter. Now, this was quite abstract, but uh, therefore maybe let's come back to the classic linear regression where our Minza equation perfectly fits into. We have an outcome variable y, we have a policy or target variable. So this is a variable we are interested in, we would like to learn about. This could, for example, be female in the Minza equation, um, and then we have x1 to xp, which are control variables or confounders so or variables we need to include in our specification. So that there is um, exogeneity holding, but this is we are not interested in. And now this is a classic linear regression. I guess everyone is familiar with, but now we are in a high dimensional setting that p is larger than n. And now what we want to do is on this target parameter uh, uh, policy variable, we want to do valid inference on our parameter of interest, theta naught. And here uh, we also introduce the confounding. Here we introduce, we'll need later, a um, confounding equation where D, our target variable, is a function or, or is correlated with the confounders or with the control variables. This simply equation here captures the confounding. Okay, now this is our problem. We're in a high dimensional setting. We would like to estimate the uh, selected parameter of interest. And now how can we do this? Uh, maybe before we come to this, you can also generalize this easily to a semi-parametric model where the effect of the confounders uh, in the main equation, but also in the auxiliary regression is modeled in an, a non-linear way. So this is a straightforward um, extension where G naught and M naught here are the nuisance parameters. If I go back, the nuisance parameter here is beta 1 to beta p and gamma prime because they are part of our problem, but we are not interested in. And here in the semi-parametric model, it's a little bit more general because now the confounding or nuisance functions are not parameters, it uh, are in functional form. And now here again, we have the min wage equation. We are interested maybe in the effect of female. Mintz originally was interested in the effect of schooling on wage. And now how can we do uh, inference on DI? And now what could we do? The naive approach would be the following. So we're in a high dimensional setting. So maybe we use lasso to estimate this part, the con confounding part. Or if we assume this is a nonlinear relationship, we use random forest or neural net to estimate here this part. And then we plug this in here. And then we regress our outcome variable on the treatment variable and the estimated parts and do standard inference. This sounds plausible, but this leads to invalid results because in this naive approach, our resulting estimator beta uh, theta naught will not be normally distributed and centered around the true value. It has some um, very complicated distribution we don't know. And you can easily check this in a simulation study. So here in the simulation study, we generated from a linear setting data in a, in a high dimensional sense. And then we use this naive approach I described before to estimate the target parameter. And we see that our final estimate, so we repeat this many hundred times and then we plot the histogram of our estimates. And we see that this uh, estimates are not unbiased centered around the true value, we have some bias in our distribution. And this is called the problem of post-selection inference or invalid post-selection inference. Uh, so, and here, if we do this naive approach and base our inference results on, 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 on this naive approach, we get wrong results. So our confidence intervals uh, have not uh, uh, required coverage and we get biased estimates. So here, inference breaks down in the naive approach. But now the question is, okay, we have a problem. How can we do valid inference in high dimensional uh, settings? And here, the double lasso or more general, the double machine learning approach can help us to do valid inference. And how does this approach work? As the name double machine learning says, we are not running machine learning only once as we do in the naive approach, we use it twice. And what we're doing is we run an 
machine learning regression of y on x to estimate the conditional mean of y given x. And then we do a second regression. We run an, a regression of d on x. So this is our auxiliary regression to estimate the conditional mean of d given x. And we can run these two regressions with our favorite machine learning uh, method. And then we take of these two regressions the residuals. So w are the residuals from the outcome regression, and v are the residuals from the auxiliary regression. And now in the final step, we regress the residuals w on each other on v. And this gives us our final estimate theta naught. And now we can do a simulation study again with this procedure. And now we see that our final estimator is normally distributed centered around the true value. So this means with this double machine learning approach, we can um, establish valid inference again. And those with some background in acromatrics might have recognized this procedure. This is called frischwalk level partialing out. Uh, in, in a classic linear regression, this is the famous uh, par uh, frischwalk level partialing out. And the interesting part is, if you are in a high dimensional setting and if you want to do inference, and now if you do in a high dimensional setting, this partialing out approach with modern machine learning methods like Lasso and of Forest, our final estimator will be normally distributed and unbiased, um, which allows us then to do valid inference. And this remarkable results has been established quite recently in the literature. And this is the key for doing valid inference in high dimensional settings. Now maybe um, this is probably now comes the most technical part. So for, uh, for those who are interested, I want to give some um, indication. Why does this naive approach not work? Why this double machine learning approach works? And the key insight is that both estimation strategies rely on different moment conditions. So the naive approach uses a classical moment condition you all know from linear regression that the error term is uncorrelated with the treatment variable. So we exploit that the expected value of epsilon times our target variable or treated policy variable is equal to zero. And epsilon is the residual. And what we're doing is we estimate the residual. So we estimate G with a naive estimator, plug it in, and solve for our target parameter. For the low uh, dimensional setting, this perfectly works out. In the high dimensional setting, we have seen in the simulation this does not uh, work out. Uh, and the second, the, the partialing out approach implicitly creates this moment condition here, which identifies our parameter. What we're doing here, we regress W on V. So if you do an univariate regression of W on V, this is a corresponding moment condition. And W and V are the residuals from this step. So here, this is the moment condition uh, equation for, for the partialing out approach. And we see here that in the second moment condition, we also have more nuisance parameter. In the naive approach, which does not give us valid inference results, we only need to estimate uh, G, the conditional mean of Y given X. Here in the partialing out approach, we have to estimate two nuisance parameters, the conditional mean of Y given X and D given X. So this is an extra burden, but it allows us to do a valid inference. And now, what is the key? Why does the estimation based on the first moment condition not work and the estimation on the second work? Because the second moment condition here has a property which has been coined Neumann orthogonality in the literature. What does Neumann orthogonality mean? If we take our score function, our moment condition, condition Psi, so Psi depends on the data, Psi depends on our target parameter we would like to do inference on, and depends on the nuisance parameter eta. In, in a nuisance parameter uh, in, in the partialing out approach where these two uh, regression functions we had to estimate. And now, if we take the expected score, evaluate this at the true parameter. So if we, what we are doing here, we take the partial derivative of our expected score function and uh, takes a partial derivatives with regard to the nuisance parameter and evaluate this at the true parameter theta not eta not. And here, this partial derivative 
is equal to zero. And this is the Neumann orthogonality property. And this means if you are at the true parameters, theta not eta not, and now <laughs> this is really very illustrative speaking, uh, in the second estimation strategy, um, small estimation mistakes in the nuisance part have no first order effect on our target parameter. This is what this um, uh, condition here says. If you take the partial derivative with regard to the nuisance parameter, at the two parameters, it's equal to zero. So this means at the two parameters, estimation errors in the nuisance part have no first order effect. And this robustness we need if you use modern machine learning methods. Machine learning methods are perfect for prediction, but nevertheless, they make small model selection errors, which in the knife approach lead to a bias in our target parameter. But if we have a Neumann orthogonal moment condition, we can uh, estimate the nuisance part by machine learning methods, plug it in, and we are fine. So this is very illustrative speaking, but this property is key. And this idea, um, has been developed now in the last years in statistics, so it's a very timely topic. So for the linear model, there were four research groups which uh, uh, derived the so-called double machine learning, double lasso, or um, deep biased lasso at almost the same time. Of course, uh, there so these are timely groups. Beloni, Chenosukov, Hansen derived this for the linear model, like Zhang and Zhang, uh, Bühlmann, uh, and courses have this approach, and Javama and Montenari also had the same idea. In a linear regression, how can we do that on a selected parameter if you use lasso um, for this? And this has been extended, not only is that you can use lasso, but um, uh, it has been generalized to the so-called double machine learning method. And this idea then, or, or orthogonalization has been applied to many models for instrumental variable estimation, for heterogeneous treatment effects. And if you're interested more in this, there's a survey by Chenosukov et al. in the Econometrics uh, uh, Journal, uh, which summarizes uh, this research. And if you want to apply this, um, maybe at the end we refer to this, we have been working on uh, software packages, in particular HDM and WML. So if you want to apply this stuff, which makes it hopefully quite easy uh, to apply this. So this was uh, the theoretical foundation. Uh, and, and now we want to apply this to the gender wage gap where we have not to do uh, inference only on one parameter, but the set of many parameters which describes the heterogeneity. And for this, um, I will pass now uh, to Philip who will dive now into the application. But I think this was necessary to understand the methods and now probably come to the most interesting part, the application. Martin, may I shortly ask one question? Of course. Yes. Um, so we agreed that some short questions in between can be allowed. Um, in your article, you mentioned also Oaxaca blender decompositions as the basic mm -hmm. decompositions of the effects. Could uh, this double uh, machine learning, which is now quite discussed, as you mentioned, be combined also with Oaxaca blender in any way? Is this or be subject to research? Philip, do you want to? Take yes, it I will briefly have a comment on that. So basically, um, so just to come back to that, so we will compare our results to Oaxaca blender decomposition. And Oaxaca blender decomposition usually works like that. So usually you have separate regressions that you estimate on males and females in the in the sample, and then um, you evaluate the difference in the coefficients like uh, uh, um, in, um, in both subsamples. So you do some comparison of the coefficients that you have, for example, right? And then you come, so you project some expected out, uh, expected average wage for men and for women, and you take the difference and that's it. And it's also like, basically it's possible to also represent it in a different way because you could um, um, estimate the this measure that you measure from the Osaka blender decomposition also by running a regression um, when you interact the gender variable with all other features and then um, you can kind of get a similar measure and that's related to our uh, to the coefficients that we estimate later on so what we do is kind of an approximation it's not exactly the Osaka blender decomposition because we had to kind of um, reduce the problem because it was if we were to run the Osaka blender decomposition 
specification in our data set, it would have taken too long time. It wouldn't wouldn't have finished because we have so many coefficients for which we have to establish. But also in the paper and appendix, we have a brief comment on uh, how you could also basically get it done for the octagon binary composition. But yeah, uh, maybe if if this question comes up again, then please uh, start. Uh, please ask it again at the end. So can you now uh, see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Before I start, I wanted to make Maybe sure that. Maybe do the, do the ah, full screen for the full screen. Does also full screen work? Um, Can you see it? Maybe to put it still, but it will probably work. Uh, maybe let's start it's, again. It's... Just let me know and let them mm -hmm. try it again. Does it work in full screen now? Yes. Yes? yes okay, yes. great. Thank you very much. All right. So yes, thank you, Martin, for um, starting your presentation on um, uh, the general framework that we use for estimation. And um, as Martin has motivated it, we have like a situation where we have many different, uh, a large number of covariates, either in the nuisance part, um, yeah, like mainly in the nuisance part, and we have to take this into account by our estimation framework. So we run uh, uh, everything based on Lasso or an estimator that's called double Lasso. And um, uh, so we have to adjust everything to that. Okay. So uh, now my part will be way more applied. So I hope that it helps to illustrate uh, the idea. And if you have any questions on the relationship between the general framework and our uh, empirical application, uh, we're really happy to uh, discuss that. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about data. So what we use is a data set uh, on the US. It's a very big data set, which in its uh, major form has uh, 3.5 million households um, surveyed uh, on an annual basis. And it's called the so-called um, American Community Survey. Why did we choose this uh, data set? There are several um, census uh, data sets in the US, and this one is, um, nice because it has uh, very many features on the individuals and um, we wanted to exploit the uh, heterogeneity so we um, um, made use of that. Um, participation is obligatory which is also nice and we hope that the sample is kind of representative um, for the US population. However, you don't look at the entire sample but only on a subsample and we looked on individuals uh, with a particularly strong attachment to the labor market. So um, we look on uh, persons who work full time and uh, year round. So uh, every week they are work on average uh, more than 35 hours and at least 50 uh, weeks uh, in a year. We look on a sampled, uh, sample with an age between 25 to 65 and we imposed a minimum uh, criterion on the wage which um, corresponds to the federal minimum wage. Uh, of seven dollars twenty five per uh, per hour in order to exclude unreasonable um, uh, unplausible um, and survey uh, respondents. Um, overall, we are left with a sample of six hundred forty one thousand individuals, and we split this sample into two subgroups. Uh, so 230,000 observations are in the so-called bachelor degree, degree data and uh, the high school degree data collects uh, the remaining uh, fraction of the observations. So um, we split the data according to the educational level that individual um, provided in that survey because we um, saw and we expected the wage gap patterns to be very heterogeneous across these groups. So uh, the first sample, the bachelor's degree sample, um, has at least a bachelor's degree, so college education, and um, the remaining part um, of the sample has at most a high school degree. So um, we have those two subgroups. Um, and when we look at descriptive statistics, we also find that the samples are very, very different. Like first of all, of course, like which is likely to be expected, um, um, uh, the the sample with higher education has on average uh, higher earnings. Also, the demographic patterns are very very different. If we look, for example, on race, but also on patterns on um, marital status, 
um, and uh, whether uh, people have children also, of course, experience and use of education because it's tightly connected to the sample definition and also on the number of hours usually worked. So, um, and we also see that not only uh, the samples vary in terms of these characteristics across these along these dimensions, but also the, the relationship or the, the um, the difference between men and women within each sample is very, very different. So, um, for example, if you look on um, the the share of never married individuals, then we see that it is uh, way higher in the in the um, bachelor's degree subsample than in the others. So some some patterns vary. So we decided to um, look on these two. Um, samples separately and also our results will reflect that so we will always see kind of every results twice so once for the high school degree data set and once for the bachelor's degree data set okay so we already were asked about oxagablana decomposition so this was what we compared our study to as a at the beginning of our study so um, usually what you uh, can consider for example of course is just like um, unconditional comparison of uh, earnings for men and women. And if we consider this, then we see, for example, that approximately 72% um, is, is the relation or the, the, the relatively speaking, um, women earn on average more or less 72% um, of that what uh, men work in this, in this subsample for those with the bachelor degrees. And um, the similar number slightly higher is observed for those in the high school degree subgroup. Now, of course, the persons, they differ a lot. <laughs> so you have to, you can take into account several um, variables that help to explain that wage gap. And then you can see whether the wage gap uh, becomes smaller on how it relates. And once we do that, and we control for human capital variable, which account for um, the schooling, like uh, educational background, and also for um, the experience individuals have, um, but also some other demographic characteristics, um, then we see that the wage ratios are more or less comparable in both groups. Of course, we have to remember that we kind of split on the educational variables. So um, yeah, that might also have some kind of, uh, or that's something that you always have to keep in mind here in that analysis. However, if you further include additional variables which are not collapsed by uh, these human capital uh, variables, and they, these variables refer to occupation, industry, uh, whether individual, how much, how many hours individuals work on average, then we can explain more on that um, wage gap. And so, more or less, the wage gap between men and women is fourteen percent. So, and it's slightly bigger in the in that group uh, with a high school degree, uh, without with at most a high school degree. So this is the kind of result that you usually get if you run Oxacarbana decomposition, or what the literature tells you. Um, so we get one number, which is this like sixty cent an hour, eighty cent an hour, and all these things. But we were more interested to find out whether, like, how that number would change according to individual characteristics. So, for example, um, uh, there is a, a typical um, result that you find in literature that um, the wage gap is generally uh, larger in the group of whites as compared to other uh, ethnic groups, like for, uh, race group, for example, like blacks or something. And this is something that we really wanted to find out whether it holds, uh, not only if you just consider unconditional uh, wage gaps where you don't take into account these background characteristics like educational level and uh, number of years they have worked prior to their job and all that stuff. So we wanted to also get a little bit more an idea on the heterogeneity is hidden there. So again, um, this is the model that Martin introduced before. So we have this interacted regression model where our female variable is interacted with a set of variables that we consider as potential drivers of heterogeneity. And these variables, they include information on marital status, on whether persons have a, ch a child at home, at least one child. And we have also a separate measure on particularly long, young child, uh, young children, 
um, such, uh, uh, I think it's defined as uh, children at most age four. Then we control for race, ethnicity, and English language ability. We uh, measure, like we consider the variation of the wage gap in terms of potential experience, also years of education. We look at industry, occupation, and hours work level uh, effects, which means like, um, yeah, there are several hypotheses that you could um, set up, and we wanted to descriptively investigate that. Um, and also uh, we have regional information, information on veteran status and college major. And all these information, they were encoded in this data set. This is also the reason why we chose it. Um, so Martin talked about high dimensional models. So what we have effectively is the number of variables that we consider is around 2000 for this high school sample and uh, around 4000 for the bachelor's degree subsample. And the difference comes from including the college major as a variable here. So this is something that's for sure only available uh, for the sample uh, of college graduates. So this is a very bit we consider. Um, overall, we perform inference, which means we uh, estimate confidence intervals and coefficients, and also uh, compute p-values for 71 and 106 um, variables. The implementation is done with uh, an R package called HDM. And it implements the double lasso uh, estimator that was introduced by Martin, more or less. It's kind of a specific case uh, or specific implementation of the double machine approach based on a lasso estimator. Um, to construct joint confidence intervals, we also use the so-called multiplier bootstrap um, in order to account for multiple testing. So let's come to our result. Um, Martin said we kind of have two different types of results. The first ones are called these partial effects, or there's a ceteris paribus uh, changes of the wage gap, like a beta j if it's negative and the wage gap overall is negative, would indicate that the gender wage gap increases by around beta j percentage points. So um, we first of all that the gender wage gap varies according to the covariates co that we include in our uh, model. And we particularly observe heterogeneity or variation of the wage gap in terms of the variables marriage, having children at home, and also race. We also do observe variation by occupation and find that it's kind of more important than variation by industry. And we investigate also the role of human capital characteristic, which do which seem to play less of a role than um, than um, the other variables that I mentioned before. Um, but of course, again, we have to take into account the split of the sample. So we do find that there is a huge change of the wage gap according to uh, education, but this is more across the samples and not within each sample. So this is a type of the result we see. So far we talked about yeah, what you can expect from the model. So let me zoom in and illustrate this here. So this is kind of the results that we get. So the red or the gray bar here it illustrates the magnitude of the coefficient beta j for each variable or each level of a categorical variable as compared to the baseline category. So for example, marital status, um, there you, we have a baseline category of never been married. And compared to that group, widowed, separated, uh, married with a spouse present, um, women experience a greater wage gap. And the effect is quite sizable. So we see that the, the wage gap for these groups are, ceteris paribus, around 10% po percentage points larger. So this is kind of the results that we get for each of these variables that we consider. And for example, um, now let's like have a look at the bigger picture. These are the results for the bachelor's degree subgroup. So for those with the higher level of education. And an interesting finding, for example, was that we observed that person, uh, women with a particularly young child um, at home, they experience a greater, uh, smaller wage gap because the coefficient is positive. And that is a little bit counterintuitive, but I think it's re rather reflecting a selection mechanism here that who survives in the sample of like full employed uh, women with young children. So this is something that's um, 
reflected here. And that's not the only, we are not the only study who find that and it's documented literature too. And uh, there's something that can be investigated further on. So we have a comment on that in the, in the paper and also at the end of this presentation. Um, before I mentioned, or I briefly sketched the, the typical result um, for race. So usually if you consider subgroups, like unconditional uh, wage gaps across subgroups, you find that, for example, uh, blacks experience a smaller wage gap, or actually the big, it's rather the other way around, like uh, whites have typically uh, a much greater wage gap overall than uh, all other groups. So here we have white as a, a baseline category, and we find that all other groups do experience a smaller wage gap on average, uh, even if we control for all these other characteristics that I mentioned before. Um, we, f we do find some variation of the wage gap by occupation, but this is like, it's a bit hard to make sense out of it because um, I think the results, they also change from one sample to another if we consider the bachelor's degree subsample and those with less education. Um, and um, we do find that it varies, but it's generally a little bit difficult to interpret uh, because like occupation could have either direction of an effect that could leave it either lead to um, higher uh, wage gap or smaller wage gap. And um, that's related also to the type of job uh, women do. And if that's kind of setting them at an advantage or not. Um, in industry, uh, we find kind of in the subsam, those with higher education, we find um, less variation of the wage gap according to industry. But um, the results for these categories is kind of um, robust across or the same across uh, the two subsamples. For example, the finance and real estate industry is in both samples uh, found to have a larger um, a larger wage gap. Um, the sample also or the data also has a variable on the numbers of hours usually worked. And um, for the bachelor's degree subsample, we don't find a significant effect, but of but we do observe that like insignificantly, but still the wage gap is increasing in the number of um, working hours. So now let's have a look at the high school degrees sample. So those with less education, and we we can confirm the results for race and marital status also in that sample. And also for children, um, it's similar, but uh, a smaller a smaller decrease of the wage gap as compared to the sample for those with higher education. Um, yes. So that's more or less the story. Um, we see that the, the, the effects are different as compared, like for occupation, the effects are very different for than for the sample with a bachelor's degree. Um, so it's kind of, yeah, of course, the definition of jobs within an occupation, if you have a, a university degree or not, is kind of different. So of, it's, it makes sense that the results might change. Um, what we do find in the sample of uh, those with less education is, that uh, we do find a wage gap penalty or whatever you call it, um, according to working hours. So those who work a lot, they um, seem to also experience a, way, a greater wage gap. So that was the result um, on these partial effects. Mm, and that's already informative. But of course, a woman is not only married and uh, is does not only have a child, does not only work in a, one occupation, and, but she does it all at the same time. Okay, so this is why we where we were interested to kind of quantify these many separate effects and see according to a, a woman's characteristic how they add up to her wage gap in some sense. Of course, like this estimate is kind of an approximation of the wage gap of that person is not 100% or only under stronger assumption, really like the individual wage gap, but it's something like a measure of that, that we can construct. So what we do is we, we take the coefficients for the variables that we see here, and we multiply it to uh, the woman's characteristics. And we do this for all women in the data. 
So if she is separate, she gets that coefficient. If she has a child, she also get that one. If and all that, if she has raised black, then we also add up that. So on, so on. So we can can get a beta x coefficient for every woman in data, and then see how they compare. Okay, and we do so in the quantile plot. So let me illustrate that. So on the left hand side, we see the results for the high school degree subsample. On the right hand side, we see the results for those who do have a bachelor degree. And these are now these beta coefficients as estimated for every woman in the data and then sorted in an increasing manner. So we start from the biggest gender wage gap experienced by a woman according to these estimates in the sample. And then we can see how that varies across the sample. So a straight line, for example, would say all women experience uh, the same wage gap. And this is like what we see here is rather that kind of varies. So we do have some women who come up here to zero or in the, high school, in the bachelor's degree subsample even come up with kind of a wage advantage against uh, men. Um, but overall, we find that, of course, most women do experience a wage gap. And most importantly, that for many women, this wage gap is very, very different than the estimate that you usually see from such an OXA garbliner decomposition that we presented like at the beginning of the results section. So we do see that the wage gap uh, changes. So apparently there are some women who have kind of disadvantages uh, features which are penalized in the labor market and others for, for others, these effects they cancel out. And one major finding that we find is that typically the wage gap um, or the wage penalty for women is typically higher than uh, in this sample for the less educated than for those with a college degree. So um, this line here on the left hand side, it's be like it's on a lower level than the right hand side. And also if you consider, for example, at the median uh, wage gap that is experienced, this is like way smaller for those uh, without a college degree as compared to those with a college degree. So this is the kind of results that you can present. And we found it uh, nice or appealing to have that visualization. And of course, it's now like the first study and in the future you might, uh, we might uh, be interested to see how that might change. Okay, so to conclude. So our goal was to kind of identify and estimate the role of key drivers of the gender wage gap. And we talked about marriage, having children at home, race, occupation, industry, all these characteristics. Um, of course, you policymakers might exploit that in order to kind of target, target their policies. For example, you might see from that graph, and this is the finding that we have throughout our entire analysis, those without higher education, they have, um, they have, they are like more more penalized for being female in the gender in the labor market than those uh, without um, a bachelor's degree. So of course you might think, okay, why won't we move women from the left to the right? On the other hand, you might find, if we as we found the results on, for example, the finance um, industry, um, if you have one industry that's found to be particularly um, unequal in terms of uh, wage gap, uh, in terms of the wage gaps, you might develop policies that um, that uh, shrinks down the wage gap in that industry, and then of course you can uh, extrapolate that on the change of that plot here. Okay, so I think now let's say 50% of the women work in the, in the finance. It's not a, like just a stylized example, and then you could imagine like how that how that curve would change. That's the idea for future developments, maybe. Um, so we wanted to quantify and also visualize the extent of a gender wage gap and how it varies across women. And we consider this as kind of a contribution to the uh, literature on heterogeneity, both theoretically, but also as an applied example. A major limitation that applies basically to everything or to every study um, that uses observational data for gender uh, economics um, is the cause interpretation because of course um, the labor market uh, outcomes are the result from uh, dynamic processes and um, it's really difficult to estimate to interpret our findings in a causal way but we can rather consider it as um, as descriptive evidence that kind of uh, gives an idea on the picture without 
saying something about the causal channels that might lead to that. So if we look into the future, we thought about the following points that might be interesting to uh, consider. So first of all, it might be interesting to update the evaluation. Um, here we use a high dimensional linear model. But of course, Martin said it, it's easy to extend the analysis to a semi-parametric or partially linear or non entirely non-parametric model for the wage gap and particularly at, in the heterogeneity of the wage gap. And um, we also use the lasso learner, which imposes an assumption of sparsity. Here it says that basically if a few uh, characteristic of, of a woman uh, contribute to the amount of, of her, uh, to contribute to the exact wage she earns. So this is some assumption that's underlying to this analysis. And of course, you could also employ other uh, estimation tools uh, that are more like more, for example, based on a sparse uh, on density uh, assumption, or that are speci specifically developed for um, nonlinearities or something. So that's something that you could do, but it was not available when we started our analysis. Um, of course, it might also be interesting to reevaluate our analysis based on different uh, studies, uh, based on different data sets, and there we had in mind. Um, most importantly, like considering maybe administrative data, uh, maybe for other countries. And uh, one flaw or like one limitation of analysis also referred to the experience variable that was actually potential experience. And of course, in a gender wage gap context, actual experience is a very important feature. So evaluating that on another data set, which maybe is better in that uh, dimension might uh, add additional value to the to the literature. Um, yes, and of course, the last thing is the causal interpretation. So we kind of um, sketched uh, sketched an idea of um, potential variables that might lead to bigger or smaller uh, wage gap. But of course, it's not causal. So whenever um, uh, researchers have access to some kind of exogenous variation, maybe through variation or exogenous changes to policies, to access to education or whatever you have, um, that of course might be uh, very, very valuable uh, to the entire uh, literature. So that was my or our outlook to the future. Um, as a last comment, we included the link to the website of WML Library, because now we talked so much about double lasso, about double machine learning. And in case you want to learn more about that, um, we are co-authors of the WML package for Python and R. And in case you would like to know more about that, you can visit the website. And we have a little user guide that guides you through the idea about orthogonality. So then I would say, I just have to say thank you from my side and um, also from Martin's side. On behalf of Martin, I say thank you too. Um, in case you have any questions, we are really happy to, to answer them now and to discuss whatever you find uh, questionable in our analysis. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you a lot. It was a great presentation, I can only say. Hmm. I would open the floor to questions naturally. Huh? We already have one. Just a second. Mm. Just a sec. Sonia Kurzbach asks, thank you so much. From your experience, is double lasso sensitive to using so many categorical controls? Um, for example, because it is sensitive to the reference category. Uh, that's a good question. Maybe I go first. Martin, you can say something on that maybe later on because like I, we, we had, so thank you for this question because I think it's a relevant question. Of course, it's important because the data, except for some variables, is basically only using categorical <laughs> variables. So that's a very valid uh, question and reasonable. Um, so we also made the analysis if we flipped the definition of the um, categories and uh, we found that the results kind of uh, do not change that. So they don't are not affected that much. Um, um, 
that's what what we had for the inference part. But of course, I'm not sure about like uh, the predictive task. We have to distinguish here because kind of um, by considering variable. So what we do here is um, we pref we do this partialing out like estimation approach. So those variables for which we do inference, they are kind of exempted from the um, from the variable selection because we predefine them as being a variable of interest or a target coefficient. And um, so it, uh, for that, it does not play a role whether they are the baseline category or not, because if we flip flip it around, the, remi the result remains more or less the same. But of course, for the predictive part, which means like for that part that's, that is partialed out, so the nuisance part, then of course it might be the case that um, Lasso might be particularly good or particularly bad in penalizing categorical variables. As, as far as we, we ran Lasso so far, we found that it works quite well and it's not too much of, of, uh, of a problem here, but of course we could um, double check that again. I don't know, Martin, if you have to add anything to categorical variables for Lasso estimation. Mm, no, uh, Philip, you already answered it extensively, but it's a good point because in if you have many categorical variables, it's always a challenge, not only for Lasso, but for any method, because we have so many categories, so many combinations, and then many combinations are not um, uh, present at all in the data. Uh, Lasso can do selection, but you have to be careful and also check stability. So, um, and Philip did say, so it's really, uh, <laughs> you need to do some robustness checks and it's a um, crucial thing to take care of. Like when we had the outlook, um, when you can consider, um, when, we co when you might consider other learners than Lasso, then maybe it might be interesting in the future to compare the results of the study if if like to what extent it runs it depends on the lasso estimator and to what extent results could be also found by other tools that might be of course very interesting if you don't employ that linearity assumption or something and as a last comment of course we kind of uh, one hot encoded uh, category features so we don't don't have included them as categoricals um um in the like now it's uh, statistical uh, programming language. So uh, in terms of the model metrics, we don't have it as a categorical feature, but we one hot encoded them. So we have like binary variable definitions. This is also why we have that, that large dimension. Okay, thank you. Anything further? Any further question? Maybe from the audience, just unmute also and ask. Presentation itself. I will shortly ask also two or three questions of mine shortly. Firstly, you mentioned the causal interpretation and also regarding the UK situation, um, these effects of this um, policy change were considered. Could your model be repeated just with, say, ob uh, observational data and um, with uh, controlling for confounders? Secondly, shortly, um, when you mention heterogeneity, Bayesian methods actually immediately come to mind, and we are in a context, um, I think, uh, UK uh, and um, the rest of the Sika society is very prone to patient methods. Could any of the patient approaches help in accessing heterogeneity in your model? And like you already mentioned, uh, you use less penalty. Could other penalties be used um, and then combined with the double machine learning approach like elastic and rich, which are common, or any other things? Maybe I start this in Philip, you add, maybe I start with the last part. Uh, in the paper we use Lasso, but the double machine learning can be used with any machine learning method, which has certain guarantees in its predictive performance. And usually all standard methods fulfill this. And this is good thing about double machine learning. It's a general framework which allows us to do inference on a target parameter where we can estimate the nuisance parameters with almost any machine learning methods we want to use. So we could use Lasso, Elastic Net, penalization based method, but we could also use random forest, uh, neural nets, and so on. So in this sense, it's a quite uh, general uh, framework. Um, maybe for the other questions, Philip, I pass to you. 
I think the first question referred to the causal interpretation. Um, I have to re remember the question. So, <laughs> um, so uh, could you mention experimental and administrative data? Could just the model on observational data be used? But probably you would expect some st uh, causal structure and confounders. But uh, probably this um, high dimensional regression could be put in observational context, right? Or so yes. with. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> yes. Um, of course, like it's very important to address causal cause concerns, and ideally, you would like to know whether, like, the difference in the in the wages that women have as compared to to men, whether it's causal, like um, matter of discrimination or whatever, or if it's just like an association because women are kind of, let's say, they just fit worse to a job than men because maybe they have higher, uh, or more, they're more involved in organization of the household and care work, so they just can't work Friday night, you know, <laughs> as maybe uh, the father of the kid or something like that. Um, the, the challenge here is that, first of all, like in, if you address it in a causal language, like first of all, female or being female or not is something that is not like a treatment, so you cannot randomize it across people. So the subgroup analysis, of course, they, they are valid if you con like unconditional subgroup analysis, if you just compare the wage gap unconditionally across uh, women uh, in a particular industry or not well that, that would be valid but due to the selection into the into the into the current state or the current position women have in the labor market that's just like impossible and of course i think one might think of identification strategies in order to identify causal effect but this was for us a separate work because uh, for first of all we want, wanted to focus on the heterogeneity part and also literature has kind of moved on there are now more works about also interpretate uh, interpret uh, on the interpretation of these heterogeneous causal measure causal measures and what assumptions you might have to include and all that stuff in order to really as in, interpret it as an individual or individualized causal uh, effect or something like that. And also, um, of course, like you ha really have to find a specific setting that has random variation in some part or that can really credibly do it. Another way also would be to run something like sensitivity analysis, that's also an upcoming topic in causal inference. Uh, in our causal inference literature, so you could also just see like, well, how how much or how strong would confounding have to be in order to set this coefficient to zero. But of course, like, it's hard to say. It's hard. Like at the end, you will come to the question to judge it and say whether I find this reasonable or not. And maybe, yeah, that's that's it's a hard question. But of course, there are many uh, economists who are really expert in that to topic, really in the and and uh, they they know how the wage gap behaves over time and all that stuff and um, we, we believe that there might be something that people can still do <laughs> so we are not too pessimistic but we just want to frame our analysis in that uh, in that direction that we say we don't say that this is like the causal evidence now i just shortly add we had a question from veronica codoni as yeah. well but also uh, due to the context have you considered uh, any bayesian extensions bayesian uh, possibilities here we're talking about heterogeneity. We have not considered explicitly Bayesian extensions. So Bayesian statistics, of course, can be valuable in many situations. Here, as Philip said, our idea was really doing more in descriptive analysis, uh, looking for in a, a representative data set, can we detect heterogeneity? But of course, Bayesian uh, approach is possible and we see more and more combining machine learning with Bayesian. So it's in any case, uh, interesting. Uh, for Veronica's question, maybe I pass Philip to you. Yes. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes. So the question was yes. <laughs> when I prepared the talk, I I had it on my <laughs> script that I should explain the gray and uh, red uh, color of the of the bars in the in the chart. So um, we just use the color to indicate the significance. So you can see or make sure that whenever the confidence interval intersect with zero, the bars are gray. And whenever we don't have the intersection with the zero line, uh, the bars are red. So the red ones are kind of significant at the 5% level, uh, jointly significant. So this is kind of a, a multi-dimensional confidence interval. And um, 
those who are great, they are not like they are positive, but they are not significant. Yes, Thank, thanks for the question because I kind of ran over it. <laughs> I forgot it. <laughs> Sorry. OK, do we have anything further? If not, thank you again, clap clap for excellent presentation and a great discussion, I can say. So the webinar was recorded. It will be accessible on the RSS Journal webinars website, um, hopefully soon. Thank you again to all to the organizers and again to the two both great speakers or the authors. And thank you, hoping to see you soon on another webinar in the same context. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the thank afternoon. you very much. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.